Bonjour tout le monde. Thanks for the wave. We appreciate yes. it. Yes. Okay. Bonjour. Bon matin. Oh, sorry. Did you want to start? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Bonjour. Bon matin. Bienvenue à tout le monde. Uh, J'aimerais d'abord vous parler du soutien que nous offrons aux locataires ainsi qu'aux personnes en situation d'itinérance. Je vais ensuite céder la parole au ministre. We all know that housing is the central challenge in Canada right now. It's a central challenge in people's lives. And this is especially true for Canadians who are struggling with the high cost of rent. That's why today I'm announcing a $99 million top-up to the Canada Housing Benefit. This benefit helps make rent affordable by delivering rent support payments directly to Canadians. The Canada Housing Benefit was launched in 2020 and has helped many Canadians since then. And today's announcement means that by 2027-2028, this benefit will have helped make rent more affordable for over 300,000 low-income households. Our government is committed to supporting the most vulnerable Canadians among us, and that includes people who are experiencing homelessness. That is why our government is also providing $100 million in emergency winter funding for more shelter spaces across Canada. This funding, which is delivered through the Reaching Home program, will go to 85 communities across the country to help them provide shelter spaces for people experiencing homelessness. This investment will help shelters increase their capacity and deliver essential services like temporary rental assistance and hot meals, which is so crucial during these cold winter months. Les annonces d'aujourd'hui s'installent au Canada. I also want to highlight that on Sunday, our government announced a two-year extension on the existing ban on foreign buyers of Canadian housing. This means that the ban will now be in place until January 1st of 2027. For years now, foreign money has been coming into Canada to buy up residential real estate. This has fueled worries about Canadians being priced out of housing markets in cities and towns across the country, and particularly in major cities, particularly in Vancouver and Toronto. By extending the foreign buyer ban, we will ensure houses are used as homes for Canadian families to live in and not as a speculative financial asset class. Our government's economic plan is about building an economy that works for everyone. And that means fighting for Canadians every day. Things are still hard for a lot of people in Canada today. But each day is also bringing more evidence that our economic plan is working. Inflation is now down to 3.4% from its peak of 8.1%. Wage growth in Canada has now outpaced inflation for 11 months in a row. There are 1 million more people working in Canada today compared to just before the pandemic. And just last week, we had some good news. According to stats can, uh, forecasts, Canada's economy grew 1.5% in 2023, and that exceeded expectations. Private sector economists are predicting that Canada will now avoid the recession that many thought was inevitable. And we started this week with some more good news. According to a report released yesterday by Bloomberg, Canada has the best battery supply chain in the world. Out of the 30 countries that were ranked, Canada came first, dethroning China for the first time. This is a really big deal for Canada. It is a big deal for auto workers it is a big deal for people who work in mining. It is a big deal for Canadians across the supply chain. It means tens of thousands of Canadians will have great careers today and great careers tomorrow. It means we're unlocking the promise of Canada for the 21st century. And it is further proof that our economic plan, built on the foundation of our investment tax credits, is working. 
making Canada a leading foreign investment destination. That is already the case. In fact, in the first half of 2023, Canada received the third most foreign direct investment in gross terms of any country in the world, and per capita, more investment than any other country in the G7. We know that many Canadians are struggling to make ends meet, struggling to juggle all of their bills at the end of the month, struggling to pay the rent. And that's why we've put in place the measures I've announced today. We also know that we have an economic plan and we have a lot more work to do on that plan to unlock a brighter future for everyone in our amazing country. Merci. Et je cède maintenant la parole à François Philippe. Merci. A reminder, we're trying to get through at least one question per person in the room. So um, I will go next to Elizabeth Thompson with CBC. Thank you very much. Uh, on housing, the announcement that you made today, why doing, are you doing it now and not waiting for the budget? Is it because of the Canada housing benefit? Was it in danger in any way of uh, running out? Um, thanks for the question. Um, we're doing it now just because the need is great. Um, I think all of us can see um, on streets, in parks, uh, across the country, um, people who are really cold and really, really suffering. And this is Canada. Um, we need to do what we can um, to be sure that every Canadian has a roof over their head and warm food to eat. And so we've been working um, with cities, with provinces and territories, um, and um, we believe um, that this support uh, is needed right now. And Second question on ports. Um, the, if you've staffed up, why are so many Canadian vehicles ending up exiting Canadian ports and ending up around the world? Well, that's a fair question. And, um, and I will say that what we're aiming to do in Thursday's auto theft summit is to address numerous levels of the issue recognizing that it is an issue relating to ports, but that is not the only concern uh, that we need to bring forward. I've spoken with chiefs of police in my region, for example, Chief uh, Tanner and Chief Nish, for example, who recognize that there's local law enforcement issues, issues relating to vehicle manufacturing, issues relating to borders, and so it's a complex problem, and we need to address each level of this problem. I will say that it's really important to recognize also, and I know this is in your area of um, expertise, that technology has evolved. Mm -hmm. And as a result of evolving technology, we need to respond as well with the technology that's available in vehicles, for example, the technology that in a million. So when we had that meeting in September, um, Francois Philippe and I met together uh, with the grocery CEOs. And that was to very clearly say and send a message with our presence that we were prepared to use all the tools at the government's disposal. That absolutely remains the case. Um, your government has also talked a lot about wanting more competition to bring down food prices in the long run, but um, one policy that stands in stark contrast with that is the supply management system. Um, given research shows that Canadians pay hundreds of dollars more uh, a year in prices because of this system, uh, I'm wondering how do, you, how do you defend it and why is that not part of your discussion of how you stabilize food prices? Yes, and I'll be very clear to folks who are watching, I don't, supply chain management is not part of, uh, is not on the table. Um, this has provided stability and, and predictability to our farmers. Uh, this has been key to the fabric of our country uh, in many parts of the country. What I said when we were tackling and what Canadians want us to tackle is the profits of the big firms. Uh, we're not going after the small guys. We're not going after 
uh, the small and medium-sized businesses. We're not after the small and medium-sized retailers. Quite the opposite. What we want is to bring more balance and fairness in the system. That's why, for example, the grocery code of conduct would address that. So I'm very much on the side of farmers, very much on the side of independent grocers. Uh, you know, when I talked to them, they said 4,900 independent grocers. They said, Minister, do one thing, two things for us you need to do. Uh, make sure that you would push for the grocery code of conduct to be adopted because now the relative weight of an independent grocer versus uh, the big global shock of COVID and the Russian invasion of Ukraine has quite rightly caused countries around the world to be concerned about resilience, resilience of their supply chains, um, particularly of their supply chains for the most essential things. Nothing is more essential than food. Um, Canada is extremely lucky to have that resilience when it comes to our agricultural system. We are lucky that we can feed ourselves, and that is a system built uh, in part through our supply management system. Uh, Mr. Freeland, two years ago you said Canada was falling behind on economic productivity and you proposed a new innovation and investment agency as a fix. Now you're delaying that agency until after the next election. So do you no longer see productivity growth as an urgent problem for Canada? I absolutely believe that economic growth, business investment, and productivity are an urgent challenge for Canada, if not the most urgent challenge for Canada. And we are collectively absolutely committed to that. Um, that's why I talked about the GDP numbers. That's why I talked about the job numbers. That's why I talked about Canada's ranking um, in the electric battery uh, competition in the world. Um, and so, yeah, we absolutely, you know, we need to work very, very hard to have an economy that is growing and that is growing to support all Canadians. That, if you asked me to summarize our government's economic policy in one sentence, that would be it. So the top line is growing, FDI is growing, uh, capital stocks are growing, but productivity per worker, output per worker is not growing at the same rate. What are you doing to address that? Um, from my perspective, one of the most important issues is to have more business investment in Canada. FDI is important. We'd like to see more Canadian businesses investing more in Canada. And um, we are working hard, as we said in the fall economic statement, working hard and collaboratively with our world-class pension funds to find ways that we can create opportunities for them to invest in Canada. So I think investment is absolutely key. Um, and I think investing in Canadians is absolutely key. And that includes everything from investing to ensure every Canadian can afford the cost of living, every Canadian has a home that they can live in. It includes investments in things like early learning and childcare, which is a productivity measure. This is an economic strategy. It allows women, all parents, but look, let's be honest, particularly women, to be more productive. And you know, we have world-class education we have to be sure that we're making the investments there as well. Can I just add to that? I know we need to go and I see the, the lights flashing, but I would say, Murat, since we've been, you've been with me at about every speech we've been giving, recently at least, but I would say digital adoption is a big thing. And I would say, if you go back to, to budgets that were uh, presented before, the big push we've done for businesses to adopt uh, digi digital tools that exist and AI, and I would That's add right. quantum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at that, you were with me at the conference. I mean, we were just, I think you were there when we interviewed the CEO of NVIDIA. When you're looking at things, for example, at AI, quantum, and digital adoption, technology is going to allow us to become more productive. And the fact that we have national strategies, that we were the first one in the world, again, 
You want to talk about first? I mean, we don't talk much because that's, that's Canada. But we're the first in the world to adopt an AI strategy. National, when we're at Blanchley Park, Canada was on the podiums. There's only one country in the room which had one, which was Canada. So we were front runner in that. We were front runner in quantum. Uh, we were making a big push on digital adoption. I think all that together is certainly going to help on productivity. And I know we probably need to go, so I'm going to turn over to you. I'm going to just uh, get to Minister Freeland, please. Um, Trans Mountain starting operation probably this spring. Can you update us on where your mind is at on a sale? Do you intend to sale, sell it this year? And what are the next steps? Uh, our focus right now is getting Trans Mountain built and getting it operational. Um, I'm sure you saw the piece in the Wall Street Journal last week that showed that the construction of Trans Mountain is already having a very positive effect on the differential that Canada is paid for our experts. Um, it went to as high as $47 a barrel. That differential is now already down to $18 a barrel. And I emphasize that because as that gap shrinks, that is more money we are not giving for free to our American neighbors, who are great, we love them, but I'd like to keep that money in Canada and that is what is happening. It's happening already. So our focus is to finish the job and to bring that differential further down. Um, we've always been clear that beyond that, um, we will move forward um, on uh, a We've always been clear that we do not intend to be the long-term owner of the asset. Do you, do you see a sale by the end of the year? Do you think that's realistic? As I've said, we don't intend to be the long-term owner of the asset. Um, our focus is get it built, get that economic benefit for Canada, and handle this in a way that brings the best benefit to all Canadians. We have one more question online. I'm going to let him go real quick. I know you have to go, but we did get a late start today, so I just want to make well, sure we have time. Well, tell the Prime time. Minister it's your fault that we're late. Yeah, Fair enough. <laughs> uh, Steve Scherer, uh, Thomson Reuters. Steve, yeah. No, Steve. We'll let you go. Okay, thank okay, you, Minister. Okay, Steve, Steve, come next week. Yeah. Merci tout le monde, bonne journée.